So welcome everyone to our uh, Montclair Design Week 2020 Petra Kucha Night. Uh, we have a great panel of people lined up to speak tonight. And um, we kind of just picked an order for the presentations that we thought made sense as a, as a group here. Um, so hopefully you enjoy them. I think there's lots of thought provoking uh, discussion to happen. And then if you don't, if you want, uh, stick around at the end. We're going to have a Q&A. Uh, where you can kind of go off of mute and turn on your video and, you know, interact with all our different presenters tonight and ask different questions. And uh, yeah, let's get started. It's a, it's a pretty fun, brisk format if you haven't seen it before. Uh, so they're, they're going to be quick. So Pecha Kucha is 20 slides in 20 seconds. Uh, so 20 seconds per slide. And ultimately, it's a little bit under a seven minute presentation. And uh, it's going to be a really fast paced event. But uh, we have a lot of great topics. Um, all centered around design, data, and inclusion. So with that, uh, let me just get, make sure the deck here is working. So first up actually is me. And uh, just my background is in data and analytics. And I'm excited to uh, run this Petra Kucha presentation. So let's jump in. In May 2019, San Francisco passed an ordinance banning facial recognition technology. Its 11 board members wrote down these key reasons for creating the ordinance. It endangers civil rights, exacerbates racial injustice, and threatens our freedom from surveillance. San Francisco is not alone. Other towns like Somerville, Massachusetts, and Oakland, California have enacted bans too. Facial recognition technology is just one example of how artificial intelligence, or AI as we commonly know it, is being used to perpetuate systematic racism. Technology companies like Microsoft and Amazon have signed government contracts, allowing AI to become a tool for surveillance. Yet, it still proves inaccurate. A recent example, falsely matching 28 members of Congress to a mugshot database. Some cities, as well as private and public institutions around the world, have chosen to adopt uh, AI ethics guidelines to essentially guide the development and use of AI in the first place. One of the most popular ones was released recently by the OECD um, and adopted by the, uh, the G20 summit countries. So it's no surprise that legal actions are being taken. In 2018, the ACLU filed a lawsuit against the Department of Justice for social media surveillance. These guidelines have emerged as grave injustices have come to light. A 2019 study looked at a trend of AI ethics principles. They looked at companies, governments, nonprofits, and other institutions that have put out AI ethics policies. In their research, they saw five key concepts emerge. And it's not surprising that humans are trying to formulate some ethics and data around AI. Uh, we are in a time where we literally have so much data that in order to do something with it, you have to use artificial intelligence. We can't uh, really control it otherwise. And in fact, 90% of digital data was created in the last two years. So how much data is that, you might be wondering? Well, today's digital universe is comprised of about 44 zettabytes. That's 21 zeros uh, after your, you know, your one, like a megabyte. Uh, that might be hard to picture, so let me put it this way. If I put all that data on CDs and stack them up, they would reach to the moon over 110 times and back. So how do we get here today, where AI algorithms are advertising winter boots I might want based on a Google search for Alpine chalets, uh, when you see a suggested list on Netflix or a you may also like on Amazon, there's an algorithm in the background that's determining that. And that data they're using uh, may simply be based on your browsing habits, but it could also be purchased from an outside company that's selling your data to them. The data from your spending habits, frequent locations, images, videos, social media, it's all being used right now. Uh, to determine how companies advertise you or how police should treat you or if you should or should not be hired. It's literally like permeates our daily lives all over the place. Um, and so much of that therefore means that our lives are kind of predetermined, right? And our future is to. So companies and governments are capitalizing on our data. Um, even the education around data actually reinforces this idea. Without realizing it, I was taught in my data, data and analytics master's program that data is um, basically everywhere, right? Data is for everything and everything could be data and everything is quantifiable. And this essentially feeds this colonial mindset idea to capitalize on information. So how do we change the narrative? Data itself is exclusive, uh, but it does not inherently create inequity. For example, the census collects socioeconomic data. This categorizes, uh, this, these categories 
directly inform lo local districting. But by placing data into categories, it also discriminates. And that's something we must consider in terms of how does it discriminate. In Ibram Kendi's latest book, he says, the defining question is whether the discrimination is creating equity or inequity. To put it in our context, is the use of our data creating equity or inequity? Data that differentiates race, like for a census, may be used to bolter, bolster representation, but it can also be used to increase polling, uh, policing. Systematic racism directly informs how data is being used. It's no accident that facial recognition disproportionately targets citizens of color, especially black men. White men designs these systems and train these systems ultimately to reinforce whiteness. So while it's innovative, if it's not actively anti-racist, I think it begs the question, is it really innovative at all? And so how does this affect us here in Montclair? Um, how can we re redesign an inclusive anti-racist future? How, what do we value? What changes do we want to see made? I think these are all questions we should be asking. So to get the ball rolling on what we as Montclairians can do, here are three ideas for taking action. First, I would say, uh, let's think about creating our own guiding principles, right? But I think we should revisit those five principles from the earlier study, uh, this time with more of a critical eye. We must be skeptical of any principle that is not reflected in action. So Microsoft on the one hand has adopted AI ethics principles, but on the other hand, they are also signing facial recognition contracts with prisons. Um, while the rhetoric of these five, five concepts sounds great, none of these explicitly address anti-racist work. And any guide of data or AI ethics must actively work against racism outright. So again, I look to Kendi who says, the greatest racist threat is not the alt-right, but the regular Americans drive for race neutrality. I think this is one of the greatest steps to AI too. So how could we as citizens of Montclair and surrounding areas pen AI guiding principles to actively work towards an anti-racist future? Uh, who would oversee these? And that kind of brings me to my second actionable point. We could consider creating a town advisory committee on data and artificial intelligence. We have 10 plus committees already like housing or parks and rec. I would say we also need a data and AI committee. And I think the role of this committee could be to draft those principles, but also to have oversight into what government agencies and companies are doing with our data and how they're using them. And then lastly, I think we can adopt the ACLU's guidelines for community control over police surveillance. This would require our local government to expose what types of surveillance technologies are being used in the community right now and going forward. And ultimately, they would have to report if they're using things like stingrays, facial recognition technology, automated license plate readers. Uh, it's a pretty easy action to act on today. So lastly, I just want to leave you with this. Town policies and principles are not too minuscule. Uh, they can actually affect change, and I would say they matter immensely. We can design an anti-racist future that in a way is truly innovative. So if uh, you found this interesting, I'd say let's continue the conversation and thanks. All right, that was pretty fast. It felt fast for me actually. <laughs> Don't know if it went as fast for everyone else. Uh, yeah, we're gonna hold all questions to the end and uh, we're gonna move right into our next presentation. So next up we have Bruni Pierre and uh, Bruni is a um, Haitian American architect in the making and uh, is looking to use her skills in the community for design and those who are usually overlooked. So with that said, I'm gonna go off the of video if I can figure out how to quickly do that. And Bruni, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Let me just get it started. All right, ready, set, go. I grew up right outside of Montclair my entire life. I would take my morning jogs to Nishwan Park and bike ride with friends to the Urban Outfitters and Starbucks. Even after the 15 plus years of weaving in and out the town, one thing that never ceases to amaze me are the houses. The homes vary in style and there's always new ones or improvements being made. Honestly, I think I can accredit my Montclair house watching to one of the many reasons why I got invested in architecture and pursued it as my career. Then lo and behold, once I got to architecture school at NJIT, I learned so much more about housing and began to realize there's a lot more to it than a pretty yard and big houses. There are doors and windows, there are codes involved, there are lots and lots of rules that no one ever even thought of. While at school learning and whatnot, I was able to reinstate my an organization called the National Organization of Minority Architecture Students. 
And last summer, we have an opportunity to host a summer class for a national student competition. We set records for being one of the largest summer studios, and luckily for me, the project was about housing, obviously one of my favorites. The project was a multi-use affordable housing complex in Flatbush, Brooklyn. We didn't want it to be just another housing complex erected in the middle of these people's environment and community, but rather we wanted it to be a place that they could themselves call home. It was a project that really opened my eyes to housing design and just how the housing market works. During our research and development stages, we met with a local housing activist, Imani Henry, who runs this amazing organization called Equality for Blackbush and a Brooklyn, and Brooklyn anti gentrification network. Their mission is to stop the displacement of low to middle income people from the community to the overwhelming gentrification crisis. In our meeting with them, we asked how does gentrification happen and why are people um, housing unit prices so disproportionately high. He told us something about how the New York City housing market works. Companies and developers are able to justify their prices because when calculating the mean salary, the salary from everyone to Bronx, Upper West Side, and Flatbush is taken into account, which ultimately screws the market prices up for everyone, even those in low income areas. According to the data collected, the average annual salary of a New Yorker is $93,196. However, the average annual salary of someone living in Flatbush is $63,170. That's a $30,000 difference that could be the difference between living comfortably in a two bedroom apartment or being cramped in a one bedroom closet. This is an example of selective lies, where if you don't read the fine print on the statistics, you can miss out on who the information is really representing. If you ask a group of design students if they like design and you say that, well, 90% of those students like design, but don't mention that you only included design students in your survey, then that's selective bias. The data isn't technically wrong, but it is misleading. So we take the average salary of someone living in Plaplish and we compare it to a two bedroom apartment which costs $2,700, utilities not included. They have a roommate, so they split the rent, which means one person is paying $16,000 a year for rent, which is about 20% of that 63,000 income. But what if that person is a parent or a child and there's no second income? Another interesting thing you probably didn't know is that in some areas, the salaries of those who are considered for Section 8 aren't included in the mean salaries. This is done in order to prevent them from being included in the average salary, which makes, um, leads the whole group of people excluded for information. It's data like this that leads to the displacement of people in their communities. However, it's not always the data that's wrong, but the way it's misused that creates the issues. Nevertheless, we expect the data we receive to be 100% true, and we usually don't question it. We expect that everyone is kept in mind and are being properly represented. If the housing market were able to be more transparent with the information they have or may not have, it could be a more inclusive experience for all types of residents. So how do we fix the problem of non-inclusive housing? Well, first we have to figure out how this data is collected who has access to it, and lastly, how is it eventually applied? Most data in the housing market is collected through resident applications, government census, general surveys, and a whole bunch of other things. In lower income areas, there are less opportunities for residents to give their information. Sometimes there just isn't enough people to help those in overcrowded cities, and other times there's just a lack of attention to detail because the mindset of making a profit is in a way rather than actually helping. And once all this information and data is collected, where does it go? Building departments and local agencies are usually the ones to obtain the data, and they don't always give it out until someone asks for it. They hold on to, they hold on to it for their own benefits. Not having that public access, access can lead to misinterpretation and doesn't help people who actually need it. Companies try to mask the problem of afford, affordable housing, sometimes by offering a percentage of their users as considered affordable. They'll have about 100 units in the building and say 20 of those are placed at an affordable rate. And then sometimes those 20 units aren't even as luxurious or as nice as the regular apartments, regular 80 apartments that are in the building. Even with all these statistics and demographics and information, there isn't enough being done to fix the housing market crisis. Private companies and agencies are withholding valuable information and hiding it in order to benefit their profit margins rather than help residents live comfortably. If the data were taken more seriously and were in the hands of those who cared, things would be different. One suggestion I have towards fixing the housing market crisis is providing more government subsidization and involvement rather than private stakeholders being in charge. With government supervision, there's less opportunity for greed and more opportunity for the information at hand to be used properly. The market would be more inclined with its residents and its needs. In the meantime, however, there are local organizations and, or and agencies that are there to assist residents that are being taken advantage of. 
JAMA, for example, is a nonprofit organization there to help property managers and owners of affordable housing and government assisted housing in New Jersey. They are focused on educating professionals in order to obtain a better housing market environment for the owners and the residents. Now bringing it all back to me and the NOMAS composition, um, as a designer, this knowledge really changed how I view housing and how I want to design for others. You may think you're doing enough because the data says so, but there's always more information hidden under the surface. And as a designer, it is my duty to go beyond that surface. All in all, I still very much appreciate the houses of Montclair. Um, don't get me wrong, but like I said, there's more to a house than just a pretty yard and big windows. The process of being able to afford a home and living comfortably within that home without the stress of money has become more of a luxury than a given right. Moving forward, we have to rethink what having a roof over your head really means. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Bruni. That was great. All right. So moving on to our next one. I know we need some kind of like way to enact like an applause between each one. Because in person, there's definitely like a lot more reaction. But I, from the, all the comments, I can tell it's there. Um, so next up, we have Jennifer Nelson. And uh, Jen is a mom, nonprofit leader, and entrepreneur and uh, excited to hear about your presentation, John. So I'm going to kick it off and over to you. Just want to make sure before you go, uh, just talk to make sure that the volume Yeah, is can you hear me? Perfect, yeah. Okay, great. All right, uh, here we go. Do Good Auto Coalition is a nonprofit committed to a more equitable world through the use of data and technology. We help social enterprises pro by providing solutions that help them fulfill and amplify their missions. Currently, our work is focused mainly in the area of food insecurity. We were founded by Diana Lee and Matt Woodruff of Constellation Agency, initially to recruit auto dealerships to help nonprofits that needed to move food, supplies, or equipment during the COVID-19 crisis. But our work quickly became much more than that. We learned a couple of things pretty quickly doing this work. First, food insecurity is a huge problem made worse by COVID-19. This data from Feeding America shows the projected impact of COVID-19 on food insecurity. So what exactly is food insecurity? The term food security not only addresses the quantity of food intake, but also considers the quality, variety, and desirability of food intake that is needed to support good health and nutrition. It's not just about missing meals, it's about having healthy food. The next thing we learned is that the food supply chain is broken. In our country, 40% of food produced for human consumption is wasted. That's almost every other bite in landfills instead of on people's tables. Food relief organizations have been able to scale their food delivery systems with incredible speed during this crisis. However, we found that they had two unmet needs that Do Good Auto Coalition had the capacity to help solve, so we went into action. The first problem was last mile transportation. We needed to make sure that food was being delivered directly to those who need it, especially because during COVID-19, vulnerable populations like seniors were being kept at home and they were unable to go to the food pantries like they had in the past. So we needed to get the food directly to their doorsteps. Second, we found that the nonprofits that were addressing this need needed tools and metrics to help identify where the community's greatest need is. In short, they needed a sustainable model to guide the equitable deployment of food resources. So our solution is twofold. The first part is an app to address the transportation problem. We've designed the user experience for this app that would handle the logistics of matching volunteers to food rescue and delivery opportunities. Food relief nonprofits would be able to post the opportunities and volunteers would sign up. The app would route out the deliveries 
aggregate the data, and input the data into a dashboard so that it could be analyzed and visualized. I like to think of it as volunteer match meets DoorDash. The second part of our solution is a data dashboard. The data solution was created and piloted in Newark. It not only shows how many meals are being delivered in a particular area, but it also solves by need for need by layering in unemployment data and affordable housing data. So here's why we piloted our program in Newark. The city has been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 crisis. In a recent survey, 36% of Norkers listed access to food as a top concern, which is significantly higher than the national average of 23%. In addition, early in COVID-19, the city of Newark struggled to deploy its emergency food operations because there were six different nonprofit organizations distributing food in Newark, in addition to the public schools but no one was collaborating or sharing the data, so there was no big picture view to inform strategic decisions. This sample heat map shows the number of meals delivered per unemployment claim in each zip code of Newark. The color gradient indicates that green areas have relatively more food per unemployment claim and red areas have relatively less. So how do we turn the red areas to green? Nonprofits can use the data to target additional food distribution area to the needed additional food distribution to the needed areas, taking on new pantries and programs, using the data to ensure equity instead of a first come first serve approach. In addition, the city of Newark has used the data to leverage its relationships with companies like HelloFresh and nonprofits like Table to Table and Do Good Auto Coalition to target additional food distributions to the areas which were receiving relatively less food. And I, I truly believe that the work that we've done in Newark is scalable across the country and even locally. But imagine a world where we could identify exactly where the need is located engage corporate interests, government, and nonprofits to meet the need and track progress. I might even suggest that this work in some form is scalable globally. The United Nations has a sustainable development goal of zero hunger by 2030. Certainly data will have a role in measuring need, uh, determining fair and equitable distribution of resources and tracking progress. In addition to this being a local and global problem, it's personal for me. My parents were both born in the early 50s, one in North New Jersey and one in segregated North Carolina. Both experienced food insecurity at some point in their childhood. So I'm only one generation away from food insecurity. So what will you do? Whether you care about this issue because it's personal, local, or global, I challenge you to consider what you can do to make sure that food insecurity is a problem of past generations for everyone. If you want to talk solutions or want to connect, my contact information is there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Jen. That was awesome. All right, and we have one last presenter. Um, I apologize, I forgot to mention in the beginning, originally we had five presenters, but um, due to a number of technical difficulties, uh, Rebecca wasn't able to join us tonight. So uh, Lou is going to wrap it up for us, and then uh, we will be um, opening our Q&A. All right, uh, Lou, just wanna make sure we can hear you. Hi, hey, everybody. Perfect. All right. Uh, I'm going to kick it off now. Well, thank you all very much. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be the person who, who closes this. And I, I want to announce that I hacked the Pechacucha model. And I'm going to use words instead of pictures. And I will tell you why. My work is on uh, online harassment. And, uh, and the violences that happen in people's lives while they are online. Uh, I specifically um, focus my work on the gender violence 
side of the problem. Uh, why is gender violence important and why and how is gender violence connected to the uh, social isolation and the uh, domestic violence problems that we feel today, that we that we fear today and we experience today? Well, uh, if, uh, if we saw a group of 10 Girl Scouts or young women who are uh, probably coming out of middle school or high school, 52% would tell you that they have experienced online abuse. This, are, this is data from the, uh, the web, uh, the Good Web Foundation from, uh, uh, by Tim Berners-Lee, um, which uh, is also interesting if you look at the fact or you cross the data with uh, violence uh, happening to women in intimate partner relationships. One in three women in the world experience violence. Um, the, the last point that I want to make related to that data has to do with the physical well-being of individuals and how they're impacted emotionally. Again, of those 10 women that would be surveyed, 51% would tell you that they have experienced emotional or physical uh, re actions and hindrances as a result of the violence. But abuse is nothing new, some people would say. And that's generally when patriarchy is speaking, but that's another conversation. Abuse is not new. It is what is called silent, the silent pandemic. But when combined with a lot of different things that are happening in the world right now, what we see is very interesting phenomena that I'm going to describe to you because, and why do I know this phenomena? I work on a helpline. We run a helpline from Montclair, by the way. Uh, it is globally, global, it has a global reach. And we support women, LGBTIQ people, and people who work in media who are the recipients of harassment online. So first one, when your information or your communications are accessed in a non-authorized way, or, how, or what we, we call in, the, in, 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 in everyday jargon, hacking. Second, non-consensual consensual distribution of intimate images. Some people call it cyber porn or porn vengeance or cyber stalking. It, th th this is, these are the legal terms that it's important for us to, 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 to understand what the legal term is and how then we use it in, the, in everyday lingo. And also the online extortion. It can be extortion in terms of uh, money, but it also can be sex extortion. So combined to the, with the previous, with the previous in, um, instance, what you have is people blackmailing uh, individuals, women, or people who identify as women with their images, threats, bullying, all of that. And finally, this can be in the workplace, and now that our workplaces are in the, at home, it can be also at school, it can be in our social settings, or it can be even in our, in our dating universes, harassment, digital harm, and yes, hate speech as one of the biggest sources of hurt and of um, well, basic, basic problems in our society today. So what can we do? What can we do with, to counter harassment online and counter this type of violence to creeping in our lives? And how can we do to counter it if it has already crept in our lives with our daughters, our sisters, our cousins? These are five steps that I love to tell people. One, identify the perpetrator. It is important for us to do the homework. We generally face and we generally uh, focus on what is happening to us. But if we look a click away, we need to make sure that we understand who the person is. Sometimes it's a robot. So make sure that you understand who is actually harassing you. Document the aggression. It's very important to take screenshots. However, by admission of, of the social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you need to copy the URLs. That is the web address of the tweet, of the picture, or of the comment that has been made online to you, because that is a way to trace what is uh, the origin of the aggression. Talk to trusted people. Most of us isolate ourselves when we are victims of, of violence. Talk to your friends, talk to people who would understand, talk to your loved ones, even talk to your boss, because sometimes the, the work life gets intertwined. Block and report. Use the tools that social media provide to you to block the aggression, report the aggression using the tools, and then start looking into avenues. And finally, strengthen your digital security. 
put passwords on your devices. Try to look at the Wi-Fi sources and try to put password on your Wi-Fi at home and try to be able to understand how you can not repeat the behaviors that led these people to come into your lives. Finally, last but not least, it is important for us to cultivate resilience. I am very tired of the notion of self-care because in, in, in the world of, of, of online harassment, self-care doesn't work. We need to do community resilience and holistic resilience and holistic security. So how do we cultivate resilience as a community and as Montclairians if we want to be able to leave online violence at the door, at the digital door? It's important for us to be present, to be present for those who need it and also to be present to ourselves in every moment of our lives, our digital lives. We need to cultivate hope. It's not like it's over and there's nothing else to do. We also need to be grateful for the things that we have and grateful for the fact that we can counter violence. We, uh, we have to laugh. We have to be able to enjoy our lives and breathe. And this is, the, this is our organization, victactiva.org. We provide online peer support for, for women, LGBTIQ journalists, activists, organizers, and human rights defenders who are facing online violence, harassment, stress, and burnout. Our helpline is free, it's confidential, it's anonymous. We provide support in Espanol, in Portuguese, and in English. So uh, make sure you, um, you visit us. We are on social media as well. And um, just stop gender online violence by being vigilant, by knowing what is going on. And uh, I think that's, uh, that's all I have for you all today. Thank you so much, Lou. That was wonderful. And I apologize that I forgot to actually introduce you, I realized, in the beginning beyond your name. Uh, but Lou is the executive director of vdoctiva.org. So, and I think she did a much better job describing what she does than I would do. Um, so, all right. Well, that was pretty quick, but that was all of our presenters. Um, what I'm going to do actually is ask all of our presenters to turn their video on now. And uh, we do want to kind of open up the floor, but we want to try to figure out a way to do it in a facilitated manner so it's not like everyone is off of Zoom and talking at once. Uh, so if you don't mind, let's do this. If, if you have a question, maybe if you can direct it in the chat and say, you know, hey, Bruni, I'd love to hear more about, um, you know, X, Y, Z, um, as it relates to housing in Brooklyn or, or whatever your question might be, right? And then this way, that'll give us a way to kind of manage it. And then um, we'll just kind of go through those questions and then we'll ask you to, you know, to at least unmute and speak your question and we can engage in a dialogue um, if, if that works with everyone. So I will give it a few minutes for people to uh, start figuring out how the chat works. And if you have any questions, uh, you can message any of us or Colin is our uh, tech person for the night and we're pretty appreciative for all your help, Colin, so thanks for supporting us. All right, well, looks like uh, we have a question to get going. So feel free to keep adding your questions. We'll kind of track them. Um, First question, I think, is directed to Bruni, though, from Lou. So, Lou, maybe do you want to explain your question and we'll start the dialogue? Bruni, I wanted to know the end of the story. So, what happened with the project in Brooklyn? And my second, the second part of the story, the, the question is, uh, will you come and help in Montclair? Because apparently most of the housing developments are high end. Where is the affordable housing in Montclair? And what's going on with Lackawanna? Please be involved in Bacawara. <laughs> um, so with the project, we went to our, the competition and we presented. Uh, we didn't win, but we received a lot of high remarks for our project being um, more so about the people and but still including design. You know, a lot of the times people just put housing in a rectangle and they say, here you go, this is all the housing that you get. But you want it to be more than that without having it to be such a cost burden. So we got recognition for that should have won first place, but 
that's debatable. Um, and then in terms of me providing support, one thing that we have to just start implementing is policies. So like in Newark, um, it, is, it is a rule that whatever development there is, at least 20% of the units there have to be affordable. And I'm not sure if Montclair is abiding to that rule. Now, 20% isn't enough. It should be 50%, but that 20% still really does a lot. And in terms of getting to these developers, you just have to, I think one of the ways to help is like, if people don't pay the rent, then it can't be that high. People are just, you know, um, submitting to it and they're saying like oh, okay well I'll just spend all my money on rent at least I have a place over my head and it's like it shouldn't have to be that way so that's my important awesome thank you Bruni uh, Petia our kind of MDW fearless leader <laughs> has a has a question or two uh, Petia do you mind coming off the mute and asking your question Oh my goodness, I'm just so thoroughly moved by everybody's presentations and um, it took a lot to sort of come out and, and make such a, a courageous um, presentation in only 20 slides, um, which could probably be much longer presentation. So I first want to say thank you to everybody who um, took on this, uh, this challenge and um, uh, but I did have a question um, just in terms of, uh, you know, so there's always that kind of funnel of collecting data and how, you know, being able to build platforms that, you know, in the way that Josh was saying that, you know, could have certain protocols to ensure that that data, um, once it goes through a process of analysis, could also still end up being um, used in, you know, properly, proper anti-racist ways. Um, I'm just curious to know if you wouldn't mind sharing, um, what are the processes of analysis that you use in your own organizations? Uh, once you're, you're collecting data, for instance, you know, how, how do you go about um, sorting through that? And I guess maybe even a follow-up question to that is, um, you know, sometimes nonprofits are <laughs> beholden to the, you know, the, um, the foundations that are supporting them in their work and sometimes they might have to struggle with the uh that that tough question of what do they share um to be able to demonstrate that they are doing the work that they set out to do so how, you know so it's sort of two questions first the analysis question and then obviously like how do you you know what do you do to retain it so that it still is um, protecting those who you're serving Um, I can kind of address this. I mean, with the with the food data that we're collecting and aggregating in Newark, um, that data is coming directly from the organizations that are um, distributing the food, and we sort of developed our our visualizations and dashboard in concert with those organizations because we wanted it to be useful to them. We wanted them to be able to make decisions about distribution, but we also wanted them to be able to use it with funders because frankly, um, you know, data is something that nonprofits struggle with and data scientists are expensive and our organization has them. And so if, you know, one of these organizations can use our dashboard to show impact with a funder, then that is, certainly a, a benefit and an unintended, a positive unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I've sort of learned in the process of doing this work is that um, we have to really educate on how to use the data um, and the fact that the data doesn't tell you what to do, right? At best, it allows you to ask better questions Right. Um, and, and there's always sort of a story behind the data. And I, you know, initially when we first, you know, put these heat maps out and some areas were red and some areas are green, people were like, oh, there's duplication of effort. There's too much food going here and not enough food. So we need to shift it. I was like, hold on. We're not taking food away from anybody. Right. <laughs> like, you know, we need to the areas that are getting a lot of food certainly need it. We need to figure out how to get more food into the areas that don't have as much. But also, 
you know, there are certain organizations, certain pantries that get more food than others. Well, in some cases, it's because those pantries have more capacity. They have staff. They have a dumpster. They can handle larger volumes of food. And there's other pantries that are small. They serve maybe, they have their churches that have 50 parishioners that they serve. So they get much less food, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I found that it was really important to always bring people back to the story behind the data. And um, I think one of our next steps is um, doing some surveying and adding some qualitative information to our dashboards so that the people who have boots on the ground who are doing the work in the community can have some input about what their needs are, what they're seeing, you know, who they're serving, what kinds of food they're, they're actually getting, what they need more of, um, all of these things that, that, you know, you can't use data to remove people from the equation. Yeah. And so um, th those have been some of my learnings and, and some of the things that we're looking to sort of incorporate as we go forward. Jennifer, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't want to put you on the hook for anything, but um, as you know, we have a, a few pantries here in Montclair, um, and, and, you know, they, they did make the headlines during um, the early parts of COVID, uh, and actually there was a, a big fun, uh, sort of a fundraiser that the town even initiated, and I was just curious to know um, if you happen to participate in any of of that um, of, our, of your own backyard, basically. Yeah, so actually my church um, it has sort of adopted Tony's Kitchen as our, you know, uh, mission project. And we actually had, a, I go to St. Mark's um, Method, um, United Methodist Church, and we had a small uh, food pantry. And once COVID hit, we donated all the food and, you know, we've um, donated money and had a program where all of the proceeds went to Tony's Kitchen. And so, um, you know, from the perspective of, you know, my, my donor dollars, um, you know, I've supported in Montclair. And I also, you know, I used to work for Table to Table, which is a food rescue. And um, I, you know, I, always believe since I've worked in nonprofits that, you know, if I, if I'm going to spend, you know, that much time somewhere, I, I should be a donor as well. So I still support table to table and table to table does work with Tony's kitchen as well. And so I know how, you know, there are, our, our organizations in Montclair are so beloved and so important um, and maybe don't get as much attention as, um, you know, Newark or some of the more urban areas, but I can tell you anecdotally when there have been food distributions um, in Montclair, you know, the county has run a few, the Y ran them, and those lines of cars would be over a mile long. Um, they went past my house, you know, when they were, I live on Orange Road, when they were distributing it at Bullock School, they went well past my house. And so, um, you know, I know how important it is here in Montclair and how great the need is with Montclairians. And so, um, yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't. Um, thank you for bringing that up because it's really important. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, every, everybody, um, I, I imagine everybody um, can link it back to, to Montclair in some way. I was wondering, Lou, if you had any thoughts on um, the question and, and, you know, how, how it's, how, you, how it's personal for you here in Montclair? Yeah, sure. I, I, I had begun writing a, an answer on the chat and then I started thinking more. Mm -hmm. You know, there is there's something to be said about being uh, a recent arrival to the U.S. I mean, I haven't been in the U.S. all my life. I am an immigrant and I have, I arrived in Montclair five years ago and my background mostly is in Latin America where sec security and safety are seen through a very different prism. And, uh, and I have to confess that uh, when I read the Montclair local, my obsession is a police blotter because it has 20 entries at most. And sometimes I take pictures and I send them to my mom and I say, see mom, this is how it's done. However, <laughs> yeah, I, I, and, and I wish we were all together because we would be sharing stories about the police blotter, but in, in the case of, uh, of online violence and the work that we do, collecting data is a double-edged sword because a lot of the work 
that we do involves very sensitive information. People's images, people's addresses, as well as crimes that are committed. So for us, data collection as well as even donor, having a donor database, as Jennifer is, is talking about, is extremely sensitive. And identity and identifying uh, goes more to, towards Josh's, Josh's presentation. I mean, for us, it is a political stance. And the political stance is that we require also anonymity, the right to privacy, and also the right to be forgotten. Uh, and those are huge topics that we could spend uh, the whole night talking about. But uh, yeah, uh, we know a lot of what happens and some things we basically choose to let go because they, they, they need to be let go. So there's data that needs to be released into the ether. Um, that was just like a, a very cathartic moment. I, I, I do also have to say, I completely relate to um, your concept of uh, community resilience as a model for how we collectively pull together. Um, I think that, um, you know, I think personally, because um, Monc you know, Montclair Design Week's um, parent organization is Design Shed, and what we did is we went headfirst into, um, we didn't really stop to think uh, how, you know, Montclair Design Week is months away. I think we just knew that we needed to do something um, that could um, respond as quickly as possible to the to the immediate needs of um, of early COVID stages, and we and we immediately sensed um, that the inequities would only amplify. Um, so we we already felt like we were behind the eight ball, um, and I think um, that's really our knee jerk reaction as an organization. We're very hands on. We're very um, outcome oriented. We really do like to roll up our sleeves. Um, I think that that really, um, there's a, there's a real range, right? I think, um, you know, and I think the first thing that people might even just say in, in the space of people that you serve, that wouldn't self care be the first thing, you know, that, um, that, uh, people who, uh, you know, people who have been abused might need first. Um, and, you know, just as an organization, we're trying to understand for ourselves how, you know, what does it mean to design or redesign a system that could be much more um, inclusive of people who can then openly talk about what abuses they might be going through, what sort of hardships they might be going through, being one generation away from food insecurity, one generation or maybe not even one generation away from um, housing uh, insecurity, uh, you know, that conversation here in Montclair is often difficult. And I, I you know, um, I don't know what, how data moves people <laughs> um, to sort of embrace that this is our reality, um, you know, and, and then to very quickly move into action. Uh, I think that's really what we're trying to explore as an organization. Um, but I'm going to be quiet now because I, I, but everything that has been brought out from, from everyone's presentation, I just love that, you know, we're just beginning to um, kind of, um, what's the word, kind of ricochet <laughs> between them because they really are so interrelated. Great. Amazing. Um, I was just checking to see if we had any other questions in the chat, and I don't, I don't know if we did unless I missed it. Um, I started to lose track at one point of the chat. <laughs> so if anyone sees one that I missed, feel free to, uh, to jump I in. I did have a question for Jen about how can we invo be involved? How can we help? There's a ton of ways to help. Certainly, um, Do Good Auto Coalition is always looking for volunteers. Um, but, you know, there are, again, you know, Montclair has Tony's Kitchen, Human Needs Food Pantry. Um, you know, give your time, give your money, give, um, you know, and, and, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is that, 
um, leadership on food insecurity is sorely lacking. Um, and, you know, Josh, your, your thought about, you know, a committee um, when it comes to data and AI got me thinking. And even in our work in Newark, you know, there are committees, I don't know how effective they are. Um, and when COVID first started and I was the operations director at Table to Table uh, in March, uh, um, a reduction in the amount of food that we were bringing into Newark and Jersey City and other places. And it wasn't because we didn't have the food. In fact, we had a lot of food because, you know, we had um, with restaurants closing and, you know, uh, distributors had all this excess food. Um, a lot of our partners had a lot of excess food. And um, what happened was that the, a lot of the pantries closed, um, whether they closed, you know, uh, for safety reasons, or a lot of them, they're are volunteer run and the volunteers are elderly and, or people would get sick and they'd have to quarantine. And, and I was like, I knew that the need was going to go up and it was freaking me out that we were bringing less food. Um, and I didn't know who to call, right? I knew that we needed, you know, in Newark, a lot of our food went to public schools, right? A, like a lot of food and the schools closed. So I knew those kids still had to eat, right? And yeah, the school feeding programs were still going, but we were sending home like bags and bags of produce with families and the community was lining up at the school and churches were sending vans to come get food from the schools and take back to their communities. So, you know, we ended up uh, engaging government, right? But even that took longer than I thought it should have. So I would say, you know, to whatever extent you're connected or have influence, um, start the conversation because, um, you know, I, I really felt like in a crisis, it took too long to mobilize. It took, you know, we had to see, we had to deal with seeing a reduction and then getting things back up to where they needed to be. And that was really frustrating for me. And I still feel like, um, there's a lack of leadership on the issue. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that I don't, exactly know what to do about or do with. I'm trying to get involved where I can, but I would definitely say, you know, uh, just find a place that feels right to you and, and get started. Okay, so um, I can help myself. I, 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 I like to already start thinking about um, where that can go. Like I wanna build on everyone's energy here. Um, and Josh, I think you were opening the door to what kind of partnership there could be, you, you know, at local government level. Um, and it had me thinking about, um, maybe this will immediately be apparent, um, but you know, tomorrow we're gonna be talking about participatory budgeting here in town and what, how to get that to happen. And this is not some far-flung idea. It is, um, it's in response to um, finding ways to localize need and to be much more, um, to, to be able to take data and to put it in a qualitative context to where funds and social services need to go. And, you know, um, I think that, you know, if, if, if you were part of what's what happened after um, immediately after COVID and, and understanding um, how the local uh, Black Lives Matter protests were, were moving into defunding, um, defunding police uh, budgets, which let's say are one of the largest um, allocations of funds um, in our Montclair budget. I, I wonder <laughs> if we were to take, um, all of the sort of slots of social needs here that we we've talked about um, today, you know, um, it seems to me like there's the seed of an idea to say, look, um, these are all services that are 
um, could possibly, uh, you know, continue to build here in Montclair and, and serve more locally. Um, we all, we have a bit of an infrastructure already that um, can understand, re, you know, responsive measure, measures that a police department would not be able to. Um, is that the kind of thing that you could see your organization being a part of? If it were to sort of, you know, take on, <laughs> you know, to say, okay, well, if we had, um, if we had a, a, you know, a slice of that budget, what, what could we do with it? And would it be, um, a way to be a model for much, you know, sort of like the community resilience, but extending into many more services. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that like, you know, engaging, you know, all of the, the right sort of stakeholders is really key. And, you know, you just using again, NORC as a case study, right? The reason that we were able to make that that pilot program work is because um, we we had the ear of the mayor's office and they brought all of the nonprofits to the table and said, you know, we need you to share this data. Had it been, you know, up to the nonprofits themselves to share the data, it never would have happened. You're talking, it, and it's interesting, but for organizations that have, and, and I speak from experience, right, that have very similar missions, right? What, what that means is there's this like hunger games approach because you're competing for the same, you know, volunteers and the same dollars. And, you know, in the case of food organization, the same food donations and food is a surprisingly competitive <laughs> business. And, um, and so there, there wasn't a lot of, you know, um, appetite for sharing among those organizations. It really was, you know, engaging government and, you know, the mayor's office saying, hey, I need you to do this. But what's interesting is, you know, as the, the, the pilot was ending and we're hoping to get the program restarted, but as the pilot was ending a week or so ago, um, everybody involved was like, you know what, can we still at least have these calls? Because what ended up happening is we had these monthly calls to sort of discuss the data, to look at everything. And it became kind of a working group, right? Where we were just looking at everything, trying to figure out what's working, what's not. And I think being sort of forced into it in a way made everybody see the value in coming to the table and working together. And that there's so much more to be gained from doing that than, than you know, everybody sort of retreating to their corners and, and not working together. So I think, you know, collaboration and, and I've said from the beginning that the silver lining of COVID are the relationships and the collaborations that are coming out of it because it really has forced people and organizations to pivot and think in new and different ways. And those relationships will continue to bear fruit well after this is over. So that for me has been the silver lining from the beginning. You know what, and just to amplify and bring Bruni, and bring Bruni into the conversation, I, I would love to hear uh, the, young, the, younger, the younger professionals, because a lot of these conversations happen uh, either at, from the top down, as you say, and that there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of politicking around, but the, what if we could use that budget to design better systems? What if we could use the budget to bring in professionals like Bruni and her crew and say, okay, let's re-engineer this whole thing. Cause I'm sure y'all, as you're hearing what we're, what, what, what Jen is talking about, Bruni, what is, what is going on in your architect, architect brain right now? Cause it's key. I mean, build systems, it's the same as build houses. Um, what I was thinking when Jen was talking is just about how like all of our topics, the like pros and cons of how COVID has really changed things. Um, and like you said, a lot of these, these conversations happen on both ends, but as a young professional, um, I definitely have more confidence now more than ever to say what I have to say because people are listening. 
um, before people weren't really listening, you know, you, you stuck your head down, you do what you had to do just to get to that, you know, professional or higher up position. But now to know that people are listening and they have their ears open to me, I think more young professionals will be out there and be able to have these conversations with the older generations who have the knowledge. So like we can put the knowledge and the ideas together to really change things. And I think that's what's needed is to have that bridge and have both generations, both, I don't wanna say old, but young and, you know, um, old, <laughs> and having them come together because you guys have so much knowledge and I'm just, my brain is going, experience. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> um, and I have ideas and it's just like, I don't know how to bring these ideas to life, but you guys know the system so well. You know, you've done it all. You've done more than your past generation and now it's up to us to do just as much as you guys have done. Um, so that's, I don't wanna speak for the whole community, but that's how me and my friends are thinking about it. And this is how we wanna push forward. And so that's why also I'm really grateful to be in this group of experienced women, experienced professionals who have a passion for this. And I know that, you know, the passion won't die as I move on into my career. It can continue to stay and continue to build and become something great. <laughs> yeah, and Bernie, I just want to encourage you to keep thinking that way because I have found, um, you know, younger people to be such great thought partners. Um, and, you know, I, I love a crazy idea. Right, because even if it doesn't work in its original format, and sometimes they do, sometimes crazy ideas like they work, but sometimes they don't, but they spark thought, right? And like I said before, they get you to ask different questions, to look at things differently. And I, you know, I had an intern last year who would ask wild questions and come up with wild ideas, but one of his sort of wild ideas led to a collaboration and a hundred thousand dollars worth of grant money <laughs> so um and, and that program took um farm surplus food and turned it into soups that we were able to distribute um and so it was an amazing program it, we it, it started because we had um 40 pallets of potatoes that we didn't know what to do with. We called it um, Project French Fry. And the thought was, what if we could get these potatoes processed into like a frozen like French fry or has something that has a longer shelf life that would give us more time to distribute it. And so, you know, I started talking about Project French Fry with people and got an introduction to this socially responsible soup um, manufacturer. Like it was just, so, and again, it came from what might have seemed like a crazy or a silly idea. So um, definitely keep speaking your opinion. And I just want to encourage you to keep going. I was just gonna say, I think that was just, um, Jennifer, that was such a, a wonderful and sweet and important um, message to, to share with, um, I mean, I, it's so good for me to hear that too. Um, so thank you. I, I just wanna say thank you to all of our presenters uh, tonight. I wanna thank Josh for being, um, so patient and willing to pull this all together, um, circumstances being what they are. I think, I think we can all pretty much relate to the um, uh, just in time <laughs> uh, way of thinking about <laughs> uh, most of our, you know, creative lives. Um, you know, this is such. I I I really do feel like we. Um, Tomorrow we'll be back on a call thinking about what what we can do um, together. Uh, but I just want to say thank you to all of you. You're such strong women. I feel it. Like I'm. It's just vibrating through my screen. And um, so uh, thank you. And I, I I think we're going to be able to do this conversation some justice um, as we continue into. Um, uh, the rest of our roster and I want to um, invite you and everybody who's still um, 
on our call today to come to our closing party on Sunday evening. Um, it is not so much a wrap up of the week as much as it is um, an affirmation of the things that we have um, been able to um, open ourselves up to as new ideas, um, to like open up the fire pits and release into the sky <laughs> maybe some of the things that uh, need to be released. Um, try not to watch the debate if you can help it yourselves. Um, <laughs> Um, but thank you so much uh, to all of you. And um, I cannot wait to um, reconvene in person and hopefully we'll be able to do that this Sunday. So thank you all. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the space. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night, Good night everyone. <laughs>